Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. And welcome back, everyone. When you go anywhere, drive a neighborhood, drive through the city, you see buildings, you see sometimes they're beautiful. Somebody's got to design them. And a lot of times it's this guy right over here. He's an accomplished architect in the New York City metro area. John Riggio is back with us. Hey, John, how you doing? Good. Great, Steve. How are you? Doing very well. And in the past, we've talked about some of the things you've done, some of the work you've done as an architect. We found out in the last two podcasts that you are also or were a tennis pro, which I never knew. And, and yeah. it was kind of a mind blow for me because I discovered that you work with some of the or played alongside some of the, the greatest tennis players ever, you know, back in the day. And as an architect, what what were some of the things that that got you going? You know, I guess after you left the the tennis pro side of things, what helped you along the way? Oh, okay. Yes. Well, one thing I had left out of some of my podcasts was originally through my schooling was taking art classes. Now, art classes, a lot of times they would lead to things like commercial art, just working as a, or artist. And, uh, but art class was a, uh, very important skill it helped in doing architect work just like on the very basic thing say uh someone draws a line there's a whole thing of drawing a line from the left to right you draw a line across a piece of paper a lot of people might like stutter with their line like they stutter across with their line but they really like making drawings they really like making construction drawings they really want to get into become an architect and things like that well, I think one class that really solved the whole problem is taking art classes, taking a series of art classes. And they always had me in art class. I was a straight A student in art. They were even trying to get me to go into commercial art, but commercial art was different as well. It, was, it didn't really match becoming an architect, which I had, they suggested becoming an architect. It seems to fit the world to become an architect, but, but art and commercial art, a slightly different type of, of employment, slightly different kinds of work. A lot of times a commercial artist uh, might end up working in different kinds of industries too. It's completely different work. But the skills of doing art, of drawing and things like that are very important. And getting the idea of how to really make things look good on the drawing. And that type of skill I had, I think it did benefit uh, my architect work. Uh, I always had the ability to get an A class in artwork. They really liked my work. Some of our teachers were even trying to get some of my artwork into our shows, our competitions. But I didn't really take it too seriously because uh, I didn't feel that was my future. It, it was a, it's a different kind of work. I know all kinds of people who are artists. Some artists, they make like these factories making um, souvenirs, putting artwork on souvenirs and selling them and all kinds of different things. We're making custom pieces of art and selling them. But it, that is a completely different future from architect work. But the skills of, of drawing and learning art, visualizing, drawing a, a nice line is very important. And uh, that was a great skill. In fact, so I was excellent in those classes. I get a straight A and they even awarded me in high school a uh, national art scholar. Wow. I received a certificate. I still have the certificate. This is National Arts Scholar. It's, it's a very important uh, award. And they tell me that it, it, it is written down someplace that they made me a National Arts Scholar and that it was, they really liked my artwork. And I think that that helps. Out. A lot of times they put together like the school of art and architecture, things like that. A lot of times colleges would, would put those together. Uh, so those skills are very important. And I I did use them and I was always a straight A student. I didn't talk about that because really architecture work is more like involved with the construction technology. I think that's really like the one number one thing about architect work. Artwork has nothing to do with any construction technology, but it has a lot to do with having the ability to make present presentation drawing. And I think that ability with artwork also helped me with doing things with the computer, taking the computer utilizing it to to take my drawings and putting them on the computer and I still had the knowledge of artwork to, to put that together I think it did help and uh, so that the art classes were very helpful I would recommend that to anyone 
because this is the, the first thing like people want to do construction like I was saying they do like a staggered line but if you were to train yourself at, at artwork you can very possibly get rid of those problems you could just draw a line right across the page and all those all those little uh, abilities to make a nice uh, presentation of a drawing is would, would improve greatly I mean that is that is one thing that is uh, important. I think yeah. a lot of people who, who are architects or going to architect cottage, I think a lot of them pick up on, on having art skills. Uh, if you have excellent art skills, drawing, you know, they call drawing illustration, things with presentation abilities, it is very, I think it's very important and uh, it can it will imp or certainly improve your grades. That, I mean, your grades are gonna be much better because you're going to make a much better presentation you're getting, getting over all those little things of like line weights and knowing about thin line, thick lines, shading, all those different things. Is, all those, those kind of problems would, would become much improved and you would, you would excel much better at that at, at architect work. So that, that's one thing I didn't talk about, but I have a, a, a many classes of art. I took art practically every year where I lived the uh, elementary school and the high school, they all had a lot of art classes. They have a very large art department. There was plenty of art classes to take. So I always took those classes and uh, I always had a straight A in those classes. They really liked my artwork. It seems like from the beginning, you were a, a very visual person. And I'd like to share something with you because I totally relate to what you're saying. When I was in high school, I was into art very much very much into art, graphics, uh, wanted to be a cartoonist. And I came very close to being a syndicated cartoonist way back in the day. I'm talking like in the 80s. Um, and I wanted, I, I dabbled in architecture uh, as an architect. And I would, you know, have a T-square and work with a triangle. And, you know, that I went down that path, but I wanted, you went in a different path instead of more of a free form line and where I wanted to have a more of a, um, you know, from a cartoon standpoint, I abandoned all of that, got into radio, but I know exactly what you're saying in terms of the, the visual part of it, because as a, as somebody who's very much interested in art, your eye, you have a certain eye that connects to your brain and that's how you became an architect. I'm, I'm sure, like you just said, putting together presentations, you have the eye for it. Um, so it's interesting how we all have those you know, paths to where we begin. Are you, I'm going to ask you, John, are you, uh, would you say you're a perfectionist when you work on drawings? Yes, yes, yes. I think it's very important to really get your drawings perfect. Like if there's little mistakes, I would take the piece of paper, throw it out, print yep. it over again, make sure everything's corrected. Because a lot of times people look at something and then all of a sudden they're, they're doing something like spell checking. They, they can point at any little thing that's wrong. So I always try to get rid of all those things that they could take a look on a drawing and point at anything wrong on a drawing. So yes, I'm a perfectionist with the drawings, yes. Yeah. So when you were back in, I, I, was this high school days or was this into college as well when you were? Yes, yes. The, the artwork has started elementary school, elementary school, middle school, high school. Yeah. And then in architecture school, there's a lot of prerequisites that are required for artwork. So I went through all the artwork and uh, my ability to get high grades, get A grades and artwork continued through college. What would you say back then, let's say, high school in that territory, junior high, what was your favorite medium to work in as, as, a, as an art student? <clears throat> oh, okay. Yeah, I think they, uh, most of the work, I think uh, that they really liked, you know, really with, with pencil work, I think just yeah. basic pencil work. Sometimes it's amazing when you see a, a great pencil drawing, it can almost look like a photograph because of the detail, the line work, the shading on it. Did you ever work in, well, maybe that's what they, they liked back then, but was there anything that you, you personally felt good about outside of maybe pencil work? Was it working with watercolors, pastel, oils, anything like that? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think with all the art classes, I tried all the different things they had. They had all kinds of different things they had. I remember even like um, sheets of copper, like pressing sheets of copper. Then mm. did all kinds of things like that. I went through all the different art classes. And um, 
Yeah, charcoal was very interesting. I remember making a lot of charcoal yes. things. Yeah. I think those came out pretty good too. Yeah, I think, but overall, I think mostly mostly pencil seems to have been the uh, my best line of, of artwork. So I'm going to ask you this question that people always ask me, those that know that I loved art back in the day. Do you ever think about getting back into it just for, for fun, hobby, anything like that? No, I think artwork really wasn't my hobby. Uh, but I mean now. I, 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 now. Yes. Now. No, making art drawings or artwork, it, it isn't really one of my hobbies. I, I don't mind doing it. It was, uh, you know, the courses were enjoyable over the years. And uh, they really liked my work. I had the ability to, to make the work. And it's, of course, it's benefited my, uh, my profession. Sure. That I have the ability to do the artwork and, and learn all those skills. I mean, that was, that was very important. Like I was saying, if, I, I, was, I just noticed, like, when you go to art, architecture school, if someone didn't really take those art classes, didn't get skills, then they might draw, like, a jagged line. And that, and that could uh, get you behind. You know, if you, if you are drawing a nice straight line and you really have art skills, it's really going to help out with architecture and architecture career. So, uh, yeah, but as far as like illustrating or things like that, I, I don't really do it as a hobby of my own. Uh, but like I said, the architect work is, uh, it's excellent work. I enjoy doing it and, and having those skills from, from years of art classes sure. it, it did help. It did benefit. I just don't talk about it because a lot of people who take art, they go into things like commercial art, illustration. Uh, some people might end up working in advertising and uh, all kinds of different things. So it's completely different, but the skills were important to, to use in, in the profession of, of architecture work. Sure. And a um, few podcasts back, I saw your drawings and uh, they're amazing. Like you can see the detail and that you, the, the work you put into it and your eye. Like I've, I had a neighbor who was an architect and he, he was great. In fact, he designed part of uh, an extension on a, on a house that I had uh, two houses back. Um, and his drawings were great, but when I look at yours, the detail that you have uh, is amazing. And then, and now, you know, you can add color, you can add 3D. There's so much that you can do with those drawings now. Yes. It's got to be uh, fulfilling for you knowing that you can add so much to your drawings. You know, we go back even like 15 years ago, 10 years ago, we didn't have the technology in terms of CAD drawings uh, and computers. Um, what's, what do you think is next in terms of drawings and plans for architecture? Is there anything that you're thinking that, Hey, next, next, next phase, you know, say 10 years from now, will it be the same as it is now or will it change? Uh, yes. Um, I think a lot of the plans as far as what I've seen, I don't think they're really going to change that much. Uh, as far as uh, a contractor receiving a set of drawings, a schematic drawing to use it to construct something, I think there was been a push to try to make the drawings where when you're drawing something, the whole drawing is a three-dimensional detail and it has a lot of information, what they call BIM information, mm. uh, building information where it would, it would combine a lot of specification information I think those those things they they sound interesting. They're interesting ideas, but I don't know if uh, they're really gonna come out with like a three D drawing. I think the two D drawing, if you have a two D drawing and it, it automatically incorporates more detail, more specification, sounds good. But uh, as far as giving all the drawings like they're all three dimensional details, I don't think that's is really that practical because it's. Uh, these each drawing still has to go to a contractor they divide them up they go to a subcontractor they have to look at the 2d plan and they have to use it to really do the construction a lot of the presentation part of the architect work the the 2d and the 3d seem to be combined together a lot better you're able to use the 2d plan and then make it into a 3d plan a lot easier right now the software is is, is becoming improved and it, it's uh, looking more photorealistic. I, I'd show you some examples of the, the 3D houses that are taken from the plan. Sure. So those things like that are, are, are very good. I, mean, I don't know if it's really going to uh, come to where they give a contractor a 3D drawing of anything. Uh, some people have been using that for what they call BIM and it's been going down for things like uh, using that for specification taking inventory of materials, 
they've been working on things like that. I, I don't know how that's really going to develop. We'll see what happens in the future with things like that. But as far as I think, as far as the construction is concerned, it looks like a 2D plan is still really the, the basic uh, drawing that's necessary to really construct the building. So I, I think it's a lot of the, the preliminary drawing, the preliminary work specifications in 3D, BIM and 3D are pretty good. But I think most of the plan is still coming out as a 2D plan that is used for construction. So I don't know how it's going to, to if it's really going to change as far as using just a 3D plan. We'll have to see what happens. Take me to a, a job site right now. We're on a job site, construction site. We're working on something. Is it the same as it has been for for almost you know, 30 years, 40, whatever, 50? Is somebody's handing, you know, are they looking at a, a set of plans in front of them on paper when they're working on a on a project? Yes, it's still the same like that, yes. And then from the drawings that the architect gives to the contractors, a lot of times those drawings, they have to go to a shop and it goes and they make what's called a shop drawing. And then the shop drawing has to do with uh, a knowledge of just their trade and also their, their company of how they like to <clears throat> install or construct part of the building. So that, that is what's going on with the drawings. Huh. Have you... Um... How often do you go to a job site? Does it does it uh, happen where they they call you out there and they want you to take a look at something and have questions for you? <clears throat> yes, I'm at the drop job site often. Usually, uh, each job I usually would visit between three or more yeah. times during the job, depending on the size of the job. And if they have more questions, they need me to go and take a look at different things on the job site. But most jobs I usually it's a minimum of three visits to the job site, and maybe it might go up to maybe. Um, maybe like uh, five or more visits to the job site, depending, depending on the size of the job. Have you ever been on a job site, John, and just looked around and said, that's not the way I had it designed? <laughs> Has that ever happened? Or it's very specific when they're, when they're constructing? Really, they are supposed to stick to the plans. They usually stick very close to the plans. There's always a slight uh, adjustment to, to how people are, are working. And that has to do with the trade. That has to do with trade, each individual contractor, their abilities to do the work and, and what materials they use. Sometimes they might substitute materials or, or the methods of putting them together. Mm -hmm. and, th and that's another part of my job is to go there to the job site, see if how they constructed the job is either going to match exactly or it's going to, or it's going to be uh, approved if they had to substitute any 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 item in, say any metal strapping was they instead of they use say a different metal strapping in in the wood, and to see if it's going to meet code or if it needs uh, any kind of co correction in there that we have to would have to add different say metal straps or things to to make it go to code. So that things like that are also happening on the job site. What do you think is the most critical part of the construction? Is it, is, is it a footer because it's supporting all that weight? Yes, yes, of course. I think any, any uh, construction, I'm thinking from, from the bottom, from the foundation to the top. I think that's how you always have to think in the construction. And that has, also does with materials. There's this thing with like, you don't want to put wood on the first floor and then put things like uh, steel on top of wood. I mean, that is really isn't how you can construct things. So you have to think about how the bottom has uh, concrete on the bottom and you're going to build up from there from, from the strength of the materials to, to the top of the roof. That's really how it's going to work. So you just sparked a, a thought in my mind. Obviously you put wood on concrete, concrete retains water. You're gonna have rot on that wood. So that's, that's kind of a no brainer, but why, why wouldn't you put wood on top of steel? What, what would be the problem there? You can put wood on steel, yes. Oh, I and thought you I heard you said don't do it. Steel on wood. Of course, you, in, in construction, that's one, one idea that you always have to think about from top to bottom. Like you would have a concrete foundation, but you wouldn't want to have wood over the concrete and then have, have steel, like a steel structure resting on wood. That is obviously gotcha. isn't going to work. The building is going to collapse. Piece of it is going to collapse or crack. And then you would have to make uh, 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 repairs to the building. So usually uh, it has to do with the strength of materials is really what you're always thinking about in architect work. That is, you're starting off with a solid foundation. Say if you were to use steel on the first floor, you could put wood on top of the steel. That, that is good. And uh, 
that because it is a, a lighter material going on to a heavier material steel that's that is like one of the basic ideas of what's happening in construction that you're always putting um uh, lighter materials on top of heavier materials that's that's like a very basic thing to think about when in any job this is why you do what you do and we have no idea like the rest of us could never be architects because that makes every perfect once in a while, every once in a while there is a problem in a job like i go to a job they want me to check something sometimes they might have rested say brick on top of a, a mm. wood beam and we'd have to make a repair to it have to would have to correct it so there's always things like that that are happening in construction that there might be some existing situation where they might have made a mistake put a piece of steel on wood and things like that and, and they'd have to you know, make an adjustment to the construction what are some of the issues that you've seen? Because you must have seen, I don't want to say you've seen them all, maybe you have, when you go to a, a construction site, or if you're called back years later and they want to, not in one that you've designed, but you know, let's say an existing structure and they want to redo it, or what are some of the issues that have you've been faced with when you've gone back to, a, or you've gone to a site for the first time? Yes. I think there's basic things. The first thing people are looking for is cracked beams, sagging beams. Sometimes the construction from years ago were made very light. They might've made floors with just two by six construction, things like that. Or uh, uh, years ago, they didn't also have any wood headers over the windows. They So there's no structural wood headers. Hmm. The building could start to tilt. Sometimes when we do overhauls of the houses, we have to put new headers over all the windows, things like that. So the, all those type of structural problems are, are have to get corrected. And the same thing with that is usually on any job, you would start off looking at what kind of uh, situation is going on with the main beam in the basement. If there's beams in the basement, columns. Sometimes they have wood columns that were just there as a repair. And uh, so that whole thing sometimes has to get renovated. They have to remove the main beam, put in new columns, footings, everything. And that is like just like a basic idea of any job. Usually you would start from the foundation and then inspect the, the weight going up the, the building and correct all those different problems. Let's say a house or, or a building was constructed, say 25, say 30 years ago. Are there changes that need to be made to make it up to code? or is it kind of grandfathered in? How does that actually work? Yes, usually they don't have to make any improvements. Only mm. when there's a renovation is made, change in the occupancy, there's a, a whole list of things that would have to get improved on any project. A lot of times they find it easier just like to gut out the whole house and then install everything into the, with the new code or new wiring, plumbing, then you have all the different fire safeties like smoke and carbon monoxide detectors, fire rated walls, things like that. So it's not, a lot of times it's easy just to, to gut everything out and start over because of that reason. Because there's all the, everything is already under the old code and it, it isn't up to today's standard. So if a building is even 50 years old, as long as it's, we call it safe, they don't have to adhere to any of today's standards like R factor, insulation, things like that. It's okay. It's, it's it, correct. It, wow, interesting. There, okay. there are some basic things they do have to upgrade. There's some basic things like having a smoking carbon monoxide detector sure. has to be upgraded. So there are a few things like that that, that do have to get updated, even though if they don't make any renovation to the house or any additional alteration, things like that, change in use. The, the, you still have to put in some things like smoke and carbon monoxide detectors that is required in all the houses. Have you ever had to uh, work with somebody that um, uh, to adhere to the ADA, the uh, American Disabilities Act, where you had to make modifications to a building? Um, and I think that act is, it's like 20 years old now, um, but more people are, are really looking at it to make sure it's accessible to everyone. Have you made had to make uh, renovations to buildings because of that? Oh, yes, yes. Mm. especially commercial structures, anything with a commercial structure, you always have to provide for handicapped toilets, accessibility, and that goes with the ADA code. The ADA code, it changes often too. The code has adjusted. So some bathrooms and, and walkways that were originally approved for handicap and, and meet the code, they ch have changed. They, they really wouldn't meet today's code. So if they, if they did any kind of renovation, they'd have to adjust those 
So there has been some changes to the ADA code, but of course on any job, like commercial job doing anything with handicap, yes, I, I do that often on all commercial jobs. Everything has to have handicap accessibility. How do you keep track of all the codes, John? <laughs> yeah, o- over the years, I, I, I had to remember volumes of codes. And Jeez. of course, you have to keep up to date to the new codes, too. Right. I always have to get the new code manuals and, and review all the ch- different changes. Fascinating talking with you. It's I learn something new every time. You know, we, we go from here's an accomplished architect to a tennis pro to a uh, great art student. At, what are you going to surprise us with next time? I guess we'll have to wait. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> John, it's always a pleasure. I uh, just want to tell everybody if they want to take a look at your work or if they're looking to, to make some changes within a building or renovate or start new, it's John Riggio, R-I-G-G-I-O, John Riggio.com. And even if somebody has a question, they can reach out to you, right? Yes, of course. Have them give me a call. Love it. All right, John, great talking with you and uh, looking forward to catching up next time. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go, and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's. It's going to be okay.